Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, Victor, grab a seat anywhere. Hello. There you go. Um, welcome, everyone, to this is the uh, industrial work platforms, the equipment platforms, and mezzanines um, presentation. Um, just to give you a quick um, insight into who the speakers are today, I'm Kevin O'Neill with Steel Solutions. Um, this is Hugh Schlegel from Wildeck and Brian Pelto from Ohio Gratings. Greg Doppler from Cornerstone will likely be joining us any minute. He had another obligation that was going to lead right up to it. Um, what we're going to do today is, is cover, obviously, the topic that we discussed, but um, Hugh and I will do most of the talking. Brian is a, um, uh, an expert in the one area, the decking, uh, of the decking area, so as, as questions come up, feel free to, to ask them right during. Don't, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, but please, by all means, if you have a question in the middle of the presentation, just raise your hand. Okay, the, um, the idea we thought, rather than just, just to be up here and talk the whole time, was we'd start off a little bit of a, uh, a pop quiz. So, um, what is the difference between a mezzanine and a work platform? Hugh, do you know the answer? I know there's a difference. I wonder if the audience knows. You think there's a, everybody talks about mezzanine, mezzanine, but MHI what, doesn't want us to use that term. And I, I know there's a reason for that. Anybody you, know what the difference is? Okay, let us show you. The difference is a mezzanine can be this upper level in a hotel, in a nice place, things like that. Work platform is a very different animal. Okay, why does it matter? Because when you're trying to sell one of these or install one of these in your building, and the building department thinks you're trying to build one of these, it can be a different thing. I had a recent example of a project in Salt Lake City, Utah, where the building official wanted an $80,000 um, permit fee because he thought they were building a second level in the, in the building. What they were building was a large work platform. So understanding the difference and, and what they are can make a big, can, can, be, a big can be a big deal from a, from a building department issue, from a permit issue, along with tax, tax liability and other things too. Um, again, a mezzanine, the key word there is permanent. It's a permanent intermediate level within a building that's part of its physical structure. So the term mezzanine is what most people have commonly called our product, and that's fine to understand what the general idea is. It's, a, it's coming in and putting a second level in where there wasn't one before. And it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's something that can be added onto a building. It's not something that has to be designed with it from the beginning. But the big difference is permanent. Most of the construction that we do, that, that Hughes Company does, is um, it's, it's you know, a piece of equipment that's being designed, that's being done. It's totally demountable. You could take it with you if you move buildings. You could take it, move it around in the, in the plant that you have it in. You can reconfigure it. There's nothing permanent about it. So mezzanines, like I said, they can be that upper level up here, something fancy like this, even on a, on a uh, computer circuit board, that's a mezzanine. But we're here more to talk about elevated work platforms. Work platforms, equipment platforms, those are the same, same thing, okay? So again, it's an addition to a building or machine that increases its usable space and provides safe and convenient access to equipment. It is not treated as permanent part of the building, okay? One of the other advantages of that is for property taxes. If you put a mezzanine in, that square footage could count in the total square footage of your building, which could increase the amount of land you need to own, depending if it's a retail operation or what, and also can be taxed at different levels. So it's really important that we start to use the term elevated work platform or equipment platform to better describe what it really is. So examples of elevated work platforms. All three of these are great examples of it. We're putting the equipment up in the air. We're doing a process, something here. This one, obviously, is a service operation for an operator. They can climb up that ladder and access the top of this unit here. Ha holding heavy equipment on here, holding conveyor systems, different things like that. Our product is typically used as a, an accessory to other equipment. It just is basically like an inexpensive way to knock out a wall and create additional space. Again, some of the other benefits of it are, you know, you've got one, one set of HVAC to do in that area. Oftentimes you've got lighting and things that are less expensive and it keeps all of your employees in a more consolidated area. <clears throat> um, to explain why we're here to, today, we're, we're Kevin, part of the... Me, go back oh, one slide. I just want to point something out on absolutely. that uh, elevated platform on the bottom right there in the circle. It's a little hard to see, but there's even a, a gantry robot uh, connected on the bottom of the, of the platform. So 
that structure can be designed basically for any application. That's, that's kind of an interesting one right there. Absolutely, so again, the, the benefit of it is not only the additional space above, but it can support the equipment for operations below, create the space for it below, and even in, in this example, support a, a piece of equipment that's on there. Okay, um, as a group, Hughes Company, Brian's company, my company, Greg's company, we're all members of the SMA. That's who's presenting today's presentation. So we're not up here as, as uh, Wildex, Steel Solutions, and Ohio Gradings. We're here as members of the SMA, okay? SMA is an industry group. It's a nonprofit group. It's made up of manufacturers that are, that are global manufacturers of this product. Obviously, it's important. We, we, um, we attend meetings on a, uh, at least twice a year basis. We work with um, consultants and people to try to work on uh, building code changes, ANSI, new ANSI regulations to make it safe for use of our products, things like that. So it's a collaborative effort of all of a, a group of competitors and, and uh, ancillary companies that are, are, are trying to do the greater good. Again, our mission, inform all industry stakeholders of the product categories we represent, work together to advance standards, quality, and really the big one is safety, okay? Uh, we're taking the lead of some of our brethren like the RMI that has uh, done a really good job in explaining what RAC is to the building departments. We want to do the same thing, go through the same process, help them understand that difference between a work platform and a mezzanine. One of the challenges that you'll have in, in, doing, in, in our product, or one of the challenges you can have is, it is not, you don't open up the code book and there's this section that calls mezzanines and it has everything that is, needs to happen there. You have to go to several different sections, IBC, find several different things and we're kind of a hybrid between a lot of different categories. And again, we don't want to be considered like a, build, a building mezzanine. We want to be a work platform that is you know, done differently. And again, we're also working on developing standards, which we'll get into a little bit later, some of the standards we've done to make sure that it's a safer operation. Because people are up off the ground, we need to make sure they're, they're working in a safe mode. Hugh, turn it over to you. Green button. Green right. button's forward, yep. Elevated work platforms. They can optimize your existing overhead space in a building, in-plan offices, storage, manufacturing, that's some of the applications uh, that have come to mind. And it costs less, certainly, than new construction, and it's easier to expand up, of course, than to build a new building and, and move out. What are they, some of the implications? As uh, Kevin was mentioning, there are codes that are involved. MHIs work with the American National Standards Institute. There is a um, they develop a standard called the Specifications for Design, Manufacture, and Installation of Industrial Steel Work Platforms, ANSI MH 28.3. There's de depreciation um, considerations. A work platform qualifies for accelerated depreciation, seven-year capital equipment depreciation, compared to new building uh, improvements uh, at 30 years. They're very flexible uh, as far as uh, configuration goes. Work platforms are all bolt together structures, very, very solid uh, designs, and we'll show you some of those in a little bit. They can be relocated and expanded as your needs change. And of course, the cost is a lot less than new construction. There's some uh, approximate numbers, about $20 per square foot versus $119 a square foot for new construction. So we have quite a few examples here to show you. Pictures uh, speak uh, louder than words in some cases. Single level uh, work platform, there's an example there with the access stair. That's another example. And this one, you can imagine, you can put some um, uh, shelving on top there and you can even enclose the bottom with some wire mesh steel panels uh, with a, a safety uh, access uh, door on there. And uh, that'll give you uh, complete secure enclosed area for tool storage or, or valuable inventory. And that can be used in a, in a, in a small area that you might have in the, in the corner. So uh, be creative and when you look at your facilities, you can get uh, a lot of utility and a lot of use out of putting in a, a elevated platform. If you think big, we can put in uh, either company here, uh, any manufacturer, can put in multi-level platforms. That, this one happens to have conveyor on, on the second level. I'm not sure what's up there. I don't think I've climbed up to the top, but uh, it's, the structures um, can be fitted to whatever your application is. Another multi-level work platform right there. 
And you can see there's stairs going up to each level. And that can be built right in. This is um, the same picture before, but it just shows that uh, a lot of the smaller platforms are used in small um, warehouses, or this is a retail backroom application. Automotive dealerships. They want people to come back to their dealership to service their vehicle. Well, they have to have the parts there in, in, uh, in the facility. So this is where an elevated platform was installed, a stair with access. You've got a sliding uh, gate here that can open for a fork truck to deliver material to the top. They store heavier uh, items on the, on the main floor, and you can have shelving and, and maybe some rack whoops, up, up on top there. So you get the most use out of, out of the available cube in the building. Warehouse application, again, perfect for uh, elevated platform. And distribution centers. Um, it's almost uh, uh, a, a must to, you know, they have these large, expansive buildings, and they're not going to just work on the main floor. They put in an uh, uh, elevated platform like this, and this, this one was just installed, and there's all kinds of conveyor running around. There's workstations here. This flooring is a um, moisture-resistant resin board flooring. It's very nice, easy to walk on for this kind of application. So distribution centers is a big area for uh, elevated platforms. Actually, and, Hugh, can yes, you, can you yeah. jump back one sure. on that? The, you know, the big thing that the distribution center work does is, if you can picture DC, there's forklifts driving around like crazy, doing, doing different operations that they have there. By getting the conveyor system up off the ground, and that it allows the fork trucks to, to move underneath and do the product that it needs by still having the picking and, and packing operations, sorting operations, merging operations up off the air, then it'll just, the conveyor will, will decline down right to the dock doors and do that. So it just gets it all out of the way so that they can have the operation down below. Again, this, uh, this is that picture you saw earlier that Kevin was talking about where we had the, uh, the robot and again, manufacturing application. There's a lot of control panels up here, a lot of wiring. There's uh, wireways along the side. Um, can be integrated uh, whichever way you want. The, I, the whole, um, uh, the challenge really is to find the manufacturer, either Kevin's company or, or my company, to work with you, sit down, and design the structure that's going to fit your needs. Manufacturing application here again. <clears throat> Any color you want. So. And conveyor sortation support, uh, again, the conveyor line you can see right, right along here. This is a, um, a, a, a bar grading floor that uh, Brian's company supplies. And there's an advantage there. Do you want to say anything about those? Any questions on bar grading? This installation is using uh, metal bar grading, which is a high percent open area. If the uh, mezzanine that you're uh, considering uh, needs a high percent open area to, to allow air, sprinkler systems, uh, um, sound, air conditioning go through. This, this is an example where you can use heavy duty bar grading. And we'll, we'll get more into the specific applications in a little bit as okay. well. Okay, we'll just continue showing some of the examples here, how you can use a platform. Packaging, another um, good application for an elevated platform. Hugh, and you, can if, I, if I could point something out on this one too. Sure. Um, the, um, one of the unique things that was done on this project here is there is a, a walkway bridge that goes over to an existing concrete mezzanine that's part of the building. And they had elevators and they had offices up here. And it was at a different elevation than they wanted this, this, this platform to be here. So as you can see, this slopes up a little bit here and slopes up a little bit here. So this whole platform allows the, the customer to have that demountable system along with this, but they, el they can access it from an existing building contractor built concrete mezzanine that's right along this edge. So just a little unique application there. Quality assurance, uh, again, another application. You can see here you have a stair system with a landing and uh, to take you all the way to the top. Paint line, if you have a paint line, we maximize the floor space down below and, uh, and above. And food applications, you have a, a hopper here to, to deposit material, and this one's obviously under construction. 
You have a, a vertical ladder to go up to different levels for service access or machine access. Modular office applications, a big uh, area where a platform would definitely uh, come in handy. There's another example right there of another modular office. Again, utilizing the space above and below. Pipe rack support. This is what um, most manufacturers can use their technology to, for special applications like this. Cold storage um, application. I'm not sure what's going on in this picture, Kevin. You want it's just a, um, I mean, that's a, that's a, a grocery picking application. And um, so they're, they're, they actually have, um, in the coolers and the freezers, they're going to have products stored. And um, they've got rack-supported structures that, that create the catwalks between there for the picking operations. And then okay. a main, a structural main aisle that the, the, their carts are going to go down and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a bit of a manual picking operation, but it's in a, in a co cooler freezer sink for a grocer. OK. So components of an elevated platform. Do you would like to talk sure. about this? I'll take over here. All right, here. Kevin. Um, so again, what makes up an elevated platform? First, the first thing that happens is underneath is the framing options. Okay, so framing options could be a bolted C-section, a beam and C-section, beam and beam, beam and bar joist, truss girder and bar joist. If if you get a chance to look up in the building here, it's black, so it's hard to see, but. What we have up there are bar joists, okay? Same technology that's bar joists and open web gird girders going this way. So it's an example, it's no different than the building construction that we use, it's just because it is modular, because it's smaller, um, because the spans are less, we can use different applications to, to fit your app, different framing methodology, methodologies to, uh, to, to fit your application. The good news about it is, we know what you, what's going to fit best for your application when you give us the specs. You don't have to know all this, but it's good for you to understand. So as an example, a C-section, that's a formed channel that, that we would form in a, in, a, in a factory, and it's a nice closed face, so on and so forth, and makes a structural C-shape. C shape. A little bit different than a C-channel that's a structural, pure structural member. A beam and C-section. So in this instance, the intermediate members here are C-sections running underneath supporting the floor joists. But we can see we have a large beam on the outside because they wanted to span a large distance. So it gives you a beam and C-section gives you a little bit more flexibility if you need a longer span in one direction um, or you have a heavier load, the beams, the beams can handle a little bit more than the C-sections can. Same thing when you get a, uh, again, you see gantry uh, ro uh, robots and cranes underneath, heavy control panels up above. This system is using all beams, so all the members there are beams, okay? Um, again, this gives you flexibility of unlimited beam, of un unlimited spans, unlimited loading capabilities, and it's very flexible. It's not the most economical, though, if the application allows use of some of the others. So we'll, we'll help you through that process to make sure that you're getting the right application. Uh, if you want to park cars on it, it's probably going to be an all-beam system. Okay, beam and bar joist. That's, that's very common as well. You have a beam girder, and then the intermediates are bar joists that run. And again, this is a bar joists are, are best used in large spans in large quantities. If you have a job that's a thousand square feet, it's probably too small to use bar joists because the manufacturing process is they want to make a, a they want to make two hundred of them. They want to have a repetitive process. So the beam can allow you the, the flexibility in one direction, strength in one direction, depending on what the loading of the application is, and then bar joists fill in and are really the, the intermediate deck supports. Truss girder bar joist is just open web. That's what you would see if you look up in the ceiling most likely. Um, it's, it's open web in both directions. So running mechanicals through it and everything else is much easier that way. They typically are a little bit deeper members. Again, longer spans in both directions and has, can have some very strong loads as well. Um, one of the things that beams do over a girder joist is it adds a layer of flexibility. If you design it one way and you want to change it a little bit, a girder joist is designed to go from point A to point B. Cutting it down and modifying it's not something that's done very often. Whereas a beam, if you decided you wanted to shorten a bay up in the future, you just literally could cut the beam shorter and boom, you'd, you'd have it modified. So it just depends on the application, what works best for you, what you need. The next component, once you've framed it out and you have your columns supporting the structure, 
is the decking, stairs, and handrail. And um, the, the decking options really are one that there's, there's a vast, vast array of decking options that are out there, though really we think that the majority of your applications are going to be handled by two of them. Okay, so the ones that you won't see quite as much is a concrete poured deck. The, the mezzanine manufacturer will, will, see I said the mezzanine word, if I do it again I've got to pay Hugh a dollar, so I hope I don't do that. The, uh, the platform manufacturer is going to build a structure underneath, it's going to provide you with a uh, composite deck or a B deck surface that's a subset, it's going to have concrete stop, and then a local contractor is going to come in and pour the concrete on top. Okay, it's, it's got its benefits and things and we'll get into that in a little bit, but not used that much. Um, one of the things, again, we talked about, the flexibility, the, uh, the, the mobility of these systems, concrete adds a layer of difficulty to that. Another option is steel floor plate, diamond plate, um, checker plate, different terms, all means the same thing. Again, we'll talk about a couple things in a minute here, but it's more expensive than the other decking and, and typically doesn't perform the way most people need it to, so it's not used as much, okay? You then get into the steel bar grating, which there's a couple different types of that, and we'll touch on that. Very commonly used, Brian touched on it briefly, that's what his company provides. It, you know, if you need air movement through, if you need light movement through, uh, bar grading is a better alternative. And then finally, the, the engineered wood panels, which would work with a corrugated decking like this white decking here, and then a subfloor would be, would be this type of product. And it's, it's, a, it's more than plywood, it's an engineered product that's, that's moisture resistant, uh, has better rolling loads, that type of thing. So to kind of touch on all of them, we mentioned air and light penetration, sprinkler penetration, and heavy, lo heavy loading durability and durability. These are options. Obviously a steel bar grating is a steel deck. It's going to be more durable than, than any engineered wood product would be. Again, other factors that might come into play, cost. Um, the, the roof deck with a, with a moisture resistant wood panel it's typically going to be the most economical decking surface that you're going to have it gives you some flexibility it it's price is pretty good it can be cleanable if you're using a pallet jacks rolling loads can be handled nicely on that ergonomically it's a little bit easier on your joints than the steel decking would be and you can get some lead credits but again in the applications that require the durability and some of the other things it might not be the right right decking choice for you again if you're looking for a solid surface that's, that's very durable, it's going to get beat on a lot. Um, perhaps that, that picture that we showed with the robot underneath, control panels up top, that's a very common type thing where you'd see a steel, steel, uh, steel floor plate or steel checker plate application in or an aluminum plate um, if it's lighter duty and, and um, just looking for something solid. Again, concrete, the benefits to it are um, you know, fire code wise, it, it's, it's non-combustible, which, which, which is a great thing for the city and also for washdown. Any of the rest of the products wash down, you have a, an ability for either the moisture to get through and sit and pool, um, or it, you, know, you can wash them down uh, with a mop, but you really can't hose them down, spray them down. So in a food application or something that gets washed down regularly, concrete may be the way to go, and that's where we'll see those types of applications. Again, common grading, this would be what's called an inch by one eighth 19W4. It's a one inch bar by an eighth inch thick. These, these, these bars here are four inches on center. That's a very common work platform bar grading. Um, it's kind of the American standard, I would say. Um, however, there's also close, me close mesh grading for pallet jack traffic, and Brian will tell you that it can be used in more than just pallet jack traffic. It's something that's more used in Europe. It's coming, uh, it's been, it's been coming, um, being used more and more here. It can be with a lighter, with an overall lighter amount of steel, which costs less money, stronger by based on the design characteristics it has. So in the right application, it's a terrific decking to use. Brian, you want to touch on the difference between the standard and the close mesh a little bit more? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. Um, if you need an open deck where you need a high percent open area for air, sprinkler systems, sound, uh, whatever going through, um, the slide that uh, Kevin just showed before this, the general industrial open bar grading, that will work, uh, but for walking on or rolling loads, really the close mesh is a better example. And the crossbars are spaced 
very close to another, not the bearing bars, but the crossbars, so that the, the grading doesn't get very heavy and expensive. You can still get a close mesh grading that's relatively affordable for uh, pallet jack rolling loads. So as an example, these, these, these crossbars here are four inches on center, and so the bars need to be a little bit stronger in this application than here. You can see they're much closer together, maybe two inches or an inch and a half. That's gonna, that's gonna lead to a, a, lighter, a lighter amount of steel to get the same support that you need. And again, we can, we can um, your, your, your equipment platform provider can help answer those questions. Brian's here, um, as well as other members of the SMA. We can answer those questions for you as you have them. Okay, so just again, showing some examples here. You can see a, uh, you can see a shelving supported aisle here coming in with a work platform here. So they're picking this down these aisles, setting the product on this conveyor and taking it away. Again, the engineered wood products, they come in an unfinished, coated or laminated. So what's the difference? The unfinished is pretty obvious what it is. It's, it's unfinished if you spill if you drop a Coke on it, it's going to make a stain on the, on the product. But it is the most economical decking option there is. When you coat it, it's a lot more durable for rolling loads, for scratching, scratch resistance. If you spill something, you mop it up, clean it up, so on and so forth. And then the laminated is the final option. Laminated is when they take a, poly, a polypropylene surface and actually glue it to the top of the board. So those are three different options. Each one has its strengths and benefits. and, and um, the SMA members can help you with that as well if you have any questions on that. Again, the engineer wood panels, it also can be, it can also be um, ESD or electrostatic discharge, which means if you're doing static, any kind of computer applications where static electricity could be a bad thing, they can actually take the static out of that, out of the board, because otherwise if, if you're walking around, you can g generate some static electricity. Rack supported structures, another application. Diamond plate, we kind of touched on it. Concrete, we touched on that. So the key in the whole thing is this. You know, use of the proper flooring system will result in good versatility and long-term performance. There is no one decking that's perfect for every single application you have, just like there's not one framing type that's perfect for every application you have. Your design professional will help you with that, help you through that by asking some good questions and um, make sure that you get the right system. So turn it back over to Hugh to touch on the accessories. You've got to have accessories, right, to make it work the way you want it. So let's take a look at a few of them. Thank you. We talked about stairways before. They can be customized if you want to uh, come up one way and have a landing and reverse the stair. Again, it's a more compact access uh, design. So that's, that just shows one example there. Also, I mentioned earlier on for elevated work platforms, where a fork truck is bringing um, a pallet up to the uh, level, you can't have an opening here. There's an ANSI standard, which is part of the, um, the design, manufacture, and installation of industrial steel work platforms. It talks about openings in paragraph 6.43, and you can look at this on the uh, MHI website. But you have to have some type of a safety gate that keeps that opening protected. Here, this is a double drop safety gate. Uh, it slides back and forth this way. This side is open, but it's closed off at the top. So a fork truck can deliver a, a load here, and then someone at the top can, can move this over this way, and then this slides to open up another area. So, and this type of a gate is, uh, makes a lot of sense where you have a high volume, high traffic, uh, loading and, and offloading materials up to that upper deck. It takes a little bit more area, but it might be right for a specific application. My slide's not changing. One more. Oh, there we go. Another safety gate is called a pivot safety gate, and you can see some of these here at the show. The, um, the gate is open, of course, when a fork truck delivers the pallet, but it pivots right here in the center. So the, uh, the operator at the top can uh, swing the gate back over. In this case, it would swing that way. And then she could uh, take her pallet jack truck there and, and access the, uh, the pallet and remove it. And then it's, it's always uh, closed off at the opening. No one can, can fall off the, uh, the platform. 
So th this gate um, it has a unique cut to width design so you can adjust the opening size that you want on your platform. And the side rails connect right to the uh, railing uh, on the platform. So it's a complete enclosed system. Again, this is a very popular gate. It meets all the standards and codes. A vari another variation of it is um, more like a, works like a, a garage door. It, swing, uh, it operates on rails and goes up and down. And you see some of these gates around here at the show as well. That's that double drop gate that I showed earlier. Again, it moves back and forth and you have two areas where you can load and offload product. Another way to get material up to, uh, in this case, it shows a, bu a building mezzanine, so we want to be careful this is not an elevated platform, but here's an application where these vertical reciprocating conveyors have been used, so fork trucks can here drop the load on the carriage and the carriage can go up and then they offload it at the top. And then this is a typical application of a vertical lift uh, on an elevated platform. So again, bring the material in, push the button, up it goes, offload it at the top. So you want to consider when you're talk, talking about installing a platform in your facility to get more space, you want to think about how to move material up and down uh, from between levels of the platform. And the evolution, not to jump in you, but the, the, the evolution of this came from, you know, the operations people need the additional space, but the safety directors were very concerned about having people be up off the ground, how do we protect them? So in the beginning when you would have a swing gate or a slide gate, it could be left open. Um, typically another, another thing that we get asked a question a lot is, what about powered gates? Can we do a gate where a, a fork truck operator could push a garage door opener and have the gate open up above? And they do exist, but they're not a very safe mechanism because if an operator's walking with a pallet jack backwards and isn't looking, pulling a pallet jack, and meanwhile the fork truck operator opened that gate from down below, bumped a button, whatever else happened, person could get hurt falling off the deck or killed depending on the height of it. So really, you know, a safety conscious uh, company is going to look at these safety gates and if they want to go to the next level even past that, that's where a VRC really becomes a, it's, it's incredibly safe. It's all interlocked so you drop, you drop the pallet in down below and send it up and the person up top gets it. One of the things that, that you have to get your companies to understand is that the use of gates, the use of VRCs, they're the same thing. It's a two-person operation. It's not something where one person takes a forklift, puts it out, takes a forklift, puts a pallet up there, gets down, runs upstairs, does it, changes the gate. You typically are going to see that in applications more where somebody's working up on it with a pallet jack. The, the operator, it's open to them. They can drop the pallets to the open side. The operators will come up, open it up, pull the gate out, open it back up again. It's a two-person operation. So it just makes it a lot, if you get that mindset, it's going to be a lot safer and a lot better application for you. Right, and then this vertical lift here has safety features built in, so if there's any jam, it, the lift stops automatically. So again, talk to your supplier, ask about safety features on accessories, you know, gates, vertical lifts, and are very important uh, to do it right. And of course, when there's a platform, you've got a lot of invest, investment in multi-level platforms. This is, happens to be a distribution center, for conveyor support there. A lot of traffic, whether carts or fork trucks driving around, don't forget guardrail. A lot of people, when they put up an elevated work platform, that's the last thing they think about. And they say, oh, I, what about uh, you know, safety and, and protecting people from hitting what I've spent a lot of money on? And the guardrail uh, can go in very quickly and can be configured whichever way you want. Again, it's a whole system accessories, the platform, the lifts, the flooring, what have you. A um, lot to think about, but talk to your supplier, the manufacturer of these products, and we'll help you through it. So Kevin, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, just to, you know, again, what, the MH, what, what SMA is working on with MHI, these are some of the examples of the specifications we've done. Um, again, we're continuing to work with that. It's both the engineers and the uh, senior management of our companies that get involved with SMA to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to make sure that it's a safe environment, that it's a um, that, that you as end users can can get uh, apples to apples comparisons on quality and and strength and durability and things like that. So some of those examples there of what we're doing. Um, the current SMA membership is right here. Um, these are the companies. Many of them are displaying here. I believe most of them are displaying here. 
you have questions, you can go see any one of those. Um, people at their booth locations. Again, we're, this is the idea behind this, the SMA is, this is a group of companies that are, are trying to do the greater good. We're trying to make the industry safer, better, the design the categories better so that you, to protect the end users out there, make sure they have the right, in, their investment is treated properly. It's not one company trying to drive a boat or anything like that. With that being said, are there any other, any questions that anybody has today? Hugh said he'd give $20 to the first quality question that was asked. I did? Hey. No. All right. Well, we, we thank you for your time. And um, Oops. if you have any, any feedback on the, on the, um, the presentation, Jeff's, the, Jeff's our managing executive with MHI. Feel free to send him an email as well. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you very much. Coming to visit.